Hi, good morning. Welcome everyone to our webinar today on Employment 101, your obligations when hiring staff. So my name is Seidel and I'm an associate in Legal Visions Health and Employment and Health and Safety team. And today I'm joined by my colleague Comfort, who is a practice leader in the same team. So thank you all for joining us in today's session. So just before we begin, we're just going to go through a couple of housekeeping points. So you will be emailed the webinar recording and the slides themselves. So if you wish to revisit them at a later date, you can do at your own convenience. And you can, throughout this session, submit any question that you may have regarding the contents of what we're discussing in the chat box. I will be happy to answer those at the end of today's session. And please also remember to complete the survey at the end of the webinar as well. Just gives us uh, some feedback just to consider about uh, if we can improve things in the future or maybe even topics for the future we're welcome to any suggestions in terms of uh, initial point as well for your consideration all attendees today are eligible to receive a free consultation with us so we can discuss how we can help with yourself so whether that be with your contracts or any of your legal needs it's just to request your uh, free consultation then please just provide us your contact details in the survey that ends up at the uh, end of this webinar and then we can look to arrange that with yourself. So moving on to today's topics then. So there will be a couple of topics that we're gonna be running through today. Namely, we're gonna talk about setting up as an employer in the UK and the various steps you need to consider when doing so. We'll then talk about the different types of employment statuses. So we'll talk about workers, employees, and the self-employed as well, and the differences between those and how to distinguish those as well. We'll then move on to talking about recruitment and the different steps to consider there. And finally, we'll talk about employment documents before moving to the questions at the end of the session. So as I say, throughout the session, please feel free to submit any question that you have, You know, whether it's a, a small question or a large question, by all means, feel free to submit it and we'll look to address them at the end of today's session. So what I will do now then is pass you to my colleague Comfort, who will speak to you about our first topic, which is about setting up as an employer in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seidel, and welcome everyone. So the first topic is setting up as an employer in the UK. And um, the first thing we'll be considering is registering as an employer with HMRC. So you must register with HM Revenue and Customs even if you're the sole owner of your business and the director of the company, and you're only employing yourself. So you're re required to register before the first payday. So that's your, before your first payday or the first time you pay your staff, but not more than two months before you start paying wages from payroll. If you've been paying yourself or your employees and you're not yet registered as an employer with HMRC, then you have to send what is known as a late full payment submission. FPS and um, generally sending a um, FPS to HMRC without providing them with a valid reason for the delay may expose your business to a penalty warning message from HMRC or perhaps you may also receive a penalty charge in some cases. Um, so if your business have, uh, you know, if you have a limited um, company and you have nine or less directors in your business, then generally you can register as an employer online using the HMRC portal. It can take up to three weeks to get your employer um, PAYE reference number following your registration, but it's something that we recommend that you look into before setting up as an employer in the UK. So as Saido mentioned there, if you would like to use your free consultation after this webinar to speak to us about registering with um, HMRC as an employer, then um, please do um, let us know by providing your contact details at the end of the webinar. So moving on to the second thing you have to consider when employing staff for the first time or setting up as an employer in the UK is workplace pension scheme. Um, pension scheme has been in the news uh, recently, we all know. But when we talk about workplace pension scheme, um, in the UK, uh, it, we, we, we work with auto enrollment and people always ask the question, what is auto enrollment? So simply put, in the UK, all employers must provide a workplace pension scheme. And auto enrollment means that you must automatically enroll employees that meet certain criteria into that workplace pension scheme. 
So there are four criteria um, that an employee will have to meet for you to automatically enroll them. One of them is that they have to be a worker to include employees. Secondly, their age. They have to be age, age between 22 and the state's pension age. I know, you know, you probably know this already. There have been debates about changing the state pension age and it's something that's regularly um, reviewed. Currently, I believe it's around 66 years, but shortly we may be looking at an increase to 68 years soon. Uh, so that is the second criteria employees have to meet for auto enrollment. The third one is their salary. So employees have, they have to earn at least 10,000 pounds per year. And finally, the final criteria is that ordinarily they're required to work in the UK. So once you have an employee or worker that meet these four criteria, then you have to automatically enroll them onto your workplace pension scheme. The other thing is as an employer, you know, employers often consider, can we delay the date we auto enroll these employees? And um, the answer is yes, you can actually delay um, the date you enroll your workers into a pension scheme by up to three months, but you must tell the employee or worker about the delay in writing. Usually we would recommend that you put that in the offer letter or perhaps the contract of employment. Uh, because you just want to let them know that actually they won't be joining your pension scheme straight away um, and there will be a slight delay of perhaps a month, two months or the three months. So um, for employees that are automatically enrolled onto your pension scheme, uh, just to explain how it works in terms of um, minimum contribution. So the expectation is that for the employee's pension pot, there will be 8% um, contribution from their earnings into their pension. So the employee will contribute 5% and you as the employer, you pay 3% of their earnings into that pension pot. So it's worth noting that how much you pay into the pension pot as well as what counts as your the earnings would usually depend on the pension scheme you have chosen for your company. And also we would always recommend that your, you as well as your employees and workers familiarize yourself with your pension scheme rules. So when you set up and you find the right pension company, they should explain the pension rules to you and they should provide you with a document which you will be sharing with your workers on the pension scheme rules. So uh, the other thing as well is usually the question we get on can employees opt out of the pension scheme once you've automatically enrolled them? And the answer is yes. So some employees, um, for several reasons, may choose not to contribute into their pension pot during that particular time. So as an employee, they may choose that they want to opt out of the workplace pension scheme. But what you cannot do as an employer is to encourage them to opt out just so you save on your 3% contribution. And you can, of course, you can't force them to opt out either. So, um, and also the other thing to note is that, you know, if an employee chooses to opt out, then you're required to automatically re-enroll them every three years. And um, so you're counting every three years from when you first enrolled them. And usually we recommend that if you were to re-enroll an employee, um, let's say in the first, after the first three years, you should just write to them and let them know that you plan to re-enroll them in case they're still in the same position and they want to opt out again. Uh, so that that is everything that you know we wanted to share with you today uh, when it comes to um, pension um, enrollment, pension pot, uh, pension schemes. The next topic that's quite important is to do with insurance, which a lot of small businesses and um, startup founders or directors uh, sometimes um, are not familiar with. So when you become an employer, as soon as you become an employer and you start hiring, you must have an employer's liability insurance. So you must get an insurance, it's called EL sometimes, um, it's referred to as EL, it's called employer's liability insurance, and it would usually pay out compensation if your employee is injured at work or perhaps they become ill through the work they do for your company. If you don't have an employer's liability insurance, you can actually be fined um, £2,500 for every day that you're not insured. So the policy you take out should cover you for at least five million pounds and your policy must come from an insurance company that is authorized by the financial conduct authority 
So if you go on the Financial Conduct Authority's website, they do have a list of insurance companies that they authorize. Alternatively, um, you can also call them if in doubt. So um, that is it on insurance. The other thing I wanted to point out as well is um, I'm only covering employer's liability insurance for a reason, because we're talking about employment law, but depending on the nature of your business, when you speak to an insurance broker or perhaps an insurance company, they will be uh, able to tell you the other insurance covers you may need for your business. Um, so please also look into that. Uh, that said, I will um, pass over to Saido, who will take you through the different ways you can engage individuals to work for your business once you're ready to start hiring. Thank you, Comfort. So what we're going to look at is the different types of employment status, because what you can do as an employer is look to engage an individual as an employee, a worker or a self-employed independent contractor. And it is important that you are able to understand the distinction between these three categories as a core protections, rights and also benefits don't apply to everyone across the board. And what you also want to do is ensure that you and the people doing your work are fully aware of their rights and responsibilities and your own rights and responsibilities as well as the employer. So firstly, looking at an employee then. So an individual is really likely to be classed as an employee. if They're required to work regularly unless they have requested annual leave, for example. They don't have the option to refuse the work that you give them and are expected to do the work themselves. So, you know, the work themselves personally being delivered by them and they're obliged to do the work they're given to them almost like a master and servant relationship and if they refuse to do work without good reason that could see them facing disciplinary action from yourself with these individuals they effectively have full employment rights depending on length of service so they have the right to be paid for example the national minimum wage from day one they have a right to a minimum notice period uh, which can be set by statute or their own contract and talking about a contract, they also have the right to be issued with a written statement of main terms as well, along with paid holidays, pay slips, and other things as well. They're also entitled to different types of leaves. So whether that be for parental leave, whether that's paternity or maternity, those may also be applicable as well, depending on the circumstances. And finally, if you were to make one of these individuals redundant, and if they had at least two years of service, then they would be entitled to a statutory redundancy payment and also if they have two years or more service they would be able to bring a claim for ordinary unfair dismissal if ever there was a dismissal where you'd not followed a fair and thorough procedure so it's important when you're dealing with employees that you are aware exactly what rights they have because if you don't follow the contract to a t or if you're not aware of the rights and responsibilities that you have as the employer you could see yourself facing employment tribunal claims it's very important that you are aware of these rights. Secondly, then we're going to talk about a worker. So a worker is effectively a hybrid between someone who is self-employed and an employee. So what that means is they have some employment rights, but not all employment rights. So an individual is really like to be classed as a worker. Um, for your company, if they're more sort of a casual worker, i.e. the work is only available for them depending on the demand for them. Uh, the work itself. So if there's not a lot of demand for the work, you probably wouldn't bother using them or engaging their services. And the best example of one of those is a zero hour worker. Maybe you own a factory, for instance, and you might have more orders than usual uh, on one occasion, maybe because it's Christmas time, people place a lot more orders. So what you may want to do is engage a casual worker just for maybe 10, 15 hours per week for a very short period of time, just to make you meet the demand there. So when it comes to these individuals, then it's really about looking at the um, business and what the demands are there when you're looking at engaging them. But it's also important to be aware of the rights that these individuals have as well, as I say, because they do have some employment rights, although not all. So some of the employment rights, and these are not an exhaustive list either, include things like a right to an itemized pay slip, a right to a statement of any terms, so a contract of employment. They also have the right to pay the minimum wage as well and protection for things like discrimination as well. But they're not entitled to all rights. So examples of rights that they're not entitled to include things like maternity leave or other types of family leave as well. Um, they are also don't have protection from a claim for unfair dismissal if they are genuinely a worker. 
Uh, and also in terms of the work itself, what we have to consider is the difference between an employee and a worker is the fact that a worker can refuse work. So if, for example, you've got a lot of work on, but they decide, you know what, I don't really fancy this shift, or actually, in fact, I'm working somewhere else that day, they can refuse a shift and they won't be subject to, or shouldn't be subject to any detriment for refusing the work. So moving on to the final category then, which is the independent contractor or the self-employed individual. So these are individuals that usually work in your business and they sort of control how and when they do the work or how or when they actually do work for the business itself as well. And instead of getting wages, the difference between them uh, and workers and employees is that they actually invoice for the services. So send you an invoice, usually um, asking for a gross amount, you pay the gross amount, and then they're responsible for their own tax affairs uh, and making sure they meet the demands of HMRC there. Now, in terms of these individuals, again, similar to workers, they can work for multiple companies. So there's no right for you to demand that they only work purely for yourself there. They can work at you know, various different businesses depending on exactly what type of organization they are. And common examples of independent contractors could be things like, or uh, individuals rather, such as plumbers. It could be other tradesmen as well, maybe a joiner, for instance. And those are the usual sort of parties you'll see working for themselves, I, usually as a sole trader or perhaps for their own personal services company as well. And with these individuals, um, another key distinguishing factor is the fact that they don't have any protection from an employment law side of things. Um, what I mean by that is they don't have the right, for instance, to a minimum wage. They don't have the right to pay slips or um, any sort of sick pay if they were off sick or holiday pay if they were taking annual leave. But that's not to say they don't have any rights because they do still have some rights and some protection. So for instance, they do have protection from things like um, breach of contract. So let's say for example, they work for you for three months and they invoice you at the end of the three months, but you didn't pay them for those services. They would still have the right to a remedy and that remedy would be potentially pursuing a claim for breach of contract in a civil claims court there. Another example of the right they do have as well is protection from discrimination. And again, if they believe their rights were infringed, they could consider it a claim in the civil courts as well. And finally, just like with employees and workers, you also have to consider your health and safety obligations to them as well, so far as is reasonably practical as well. So hopefully that's given you an insight into the three different types of employment status or the three main types of employment status. But what I'm going to do now is pass it back over to my colleague Comfort, who will explain some of the things you should consider before or during recruitment. Thank you very much, Saido. Uh, and just to uh, give a quick recap, so far we've taken you um, through a journey as to how to set up as an employer. And Saido has kindly taken us through consideration of how best to hire a person or what type of worker or staff you want. Are they self-employed or should they be an employee or perhaps a worker? So the next step now is you've decided on, you know, you want an employee or perhaps a worker and we're looking at recruitment. Um, so as your business grows, you will be looking to hire new staff. And when you're thinking about recruitment, I'll touch on certain things you have to bear in mind or you have to consider. And the first one is actually the job description. So when you've decided you want to hire an employee or perhaps you need a worker, you have to think about the job description because you want to prepare a detailed job description before advertising a vacancy. What this will do is to allow you to carefully consider the skills and experience required for that specific role. Also, by setting out um, uh, the job description and the requirements in writing, your objective approach, which of course will not be um, influenced by any discriminatory considerations or factors, will be clear for yourself or perhaps your hiring manager if you're passing on that responsibility and even the candidates to refer to. So you want to have that in writing a job description and you want it to be quite clear and just clearly specifying the skills and experience required. The other thing you have to do as well is just to ensure that you don't expose your business to unlawful discrimination claim, because as some of us may know, um, a job candidate can bring a claim um, of unlawful discrimination against your company, depending on um, the ad a job advert. So we always recommend a few things and I'll go through that with you right now. The first one is language. 
using appropriate language when, um, when, when drafting or preparing your job description. So example, if you had a job title that said, I'm looking for a cleaning lady, that is definitely not appropriate as what is suggests there is that you are only intending to hire a woman for that role and that will be looking at sex discrimination. So it's not appropriate. So what we recommend is that you set out accurately um, also the duties and responsibilities you expect your new hire to carry out on a regular basis. Yes, we do have contracts and we will prepare contracts for you whereby it would say that employees may be required to do other duties from time to time, but you should ensure that the duties and responsibilities they'll be doing on a daily basis or regularly are set out in the job, job description as well. And also, to be fair, you do want to hire the best candidates and a qualified candidate for the role. So if you were to put out a job description that has limited list of skills or experience or doesn't accurately reflect what you're looking for in a candidate, then you may not be getting a qualified candidate, which means that you may be wasting your time and perhaps the process of recruitment may be in vain because you may not find that right candidate for the role. The other thing as well um, we would like you to do is to try and focus on the outcome that is expected in that role instead of trying to detail specifically how a candidate or how a person uh, will, you know, will do the work or how the work will be done by them. So just set out, you know, these are the outcomes, these are the expectations for this role. And then when the candidate joins, then with their skills and experience, um, you can work together to um, provide equipment for them to complete the role appropriately. The other thing as well is to avoid unnecessary um, working patterns, specifying that in the job description. So the more you try and box yourself in by saying, I only want to hire full-time staff, you may miss out on talented candidates that are only available on a part-time basis or perhaps can um, are willing to have a job share arrangement. So if possible, our advice is usually to, you know, to companies is try and widen the pool of potential applicants by considering um, flexible approach to working. As I mentioned, um, you can have people that work part-time, full-time, or a job share. And also now hybrid working is really, really appealing to job seekers. So if a role is one that um, an employee can also work from home perhaps two to three times a week, then you should specify that, you know, hybrid working, home working, and, and all these other flexibility, it would be able to open up the pool for you to get the best candidate for the job. And moving on quickly um, to the other thing you have to consider during interviews is the need for an adjustment. So you may have um, a disabled individual that needs support when applying for a job in your company. So you should always try and speak to them to understand the adjustments they will need. That can be an adjustment to the interview process or perhaps your job application process or the interview. So you're required to consider um, their request and make reasonable adjustments to your premises or the interview process in order to ensure that you know, these candidates are not placed at a substantially um, as a substantial disadvantage when compared to other people that are applying to the same job. And generally, the question is always, what is reasonable? We get that a lot. And the answer is, it depends on a number of factors, and that includes the size of your business. So if it's just a one-man ban, or, um, and you have limited resources available to you, then what is reasonable to you know, your business in that instance cannot be compared to a larger multinational organization. And also the other factors they look at it will be the cost of making that adjustment and the extent that adjustment is in fact possible. Um, the other thing as well you should consider when um, advertising a role is the salary for the role. Almost all employees and workers um, are entitled to the national minimum wage, Saido mentioned in this presentation. The minimum rate you are required to pay will depend on the individual's age and if they're an apprentice. So um, as you may know, the rent rates have changed recently this month. So now employees that are aged 23 and over should be paid at least £10.42 per hour. And those 21 to 22 should be paid um, £10.18 and so on, as you can see on the screen. Um, and those under the age of 18 um, should not earn lower than £5.28 per hour and apprentices are on the same rate as well. If you, you know, if you've hired an employee already and they were on national minimum wage last year, I would highly recommend that you revisit their contract and ensure that you update the rates as well to meet the national minimum wage as it has been changed right now. Um, 
always um, useful as well. And also it's good to let you know that we do have a number of health articles on national minimum wage on our website, which is legalvision.co.uk. So these are all free resources for you. And we recommend that you check them out um, after the webinar. And once you check them out, if you want to sit with one of us and discuss um, how to meet your national minimum wage or any other subjects we've touched on today, then please feel free to use the free consultation that comes with um, your attendance today. And without any further delay, I'll just pass to Saido, um, who will take you through the key documents that you need to provide once you found the right candidate. Thank you, Dave Comfort. So that is indeed what we're going to be discussing in terms of the key employment documents that we need to consider after the interview process. So the first thing we we'll to consider is the offer letter itself to the successful candidate or candidates, depending on your recruitment exercise. And that follows the interviewing process. And what this letter is going to be really doing is setting out the key information about the role, for example, the title itself, the salary, and also whether it's going to be a fixed term or permanent position, again, depending on your requirements. And what its purpose is there is to clarify exactly whether or not this job is going to be subject to any terms and conditions. So that could be subject to references. It could be subject to a DVS check, a disclosure bar and service check. That is, for example, if the work is going to be with children or vulnerable adults as well, or perhaps in a regulated industry, such as the financial industry or even the legal industry. You have to also consider as well the fact that you'll need to um, ask any candidates or any successful candidates to provide you with their proof of the right to live and work in the UK as well. And you can make the offer conditional upon satisfactory receipt of that as well. And what you can do with the offer letter is basically say that if that you don't receive satisfactory evidence of those items that we just mentioned, then you can look to withdraw the offer. That would mean that, you know, if you didn't go ahead with the individual, you wouldn't be in breach of contract because you've got the right in the offer letter to withdraw the offer itself. And you can also send a time limited offer as well, because in certain circumstances, you might have seen in the past where you've just not heard from a candidate for a while. Maybe they've just forgotten or maybe they've got another offer elsewhere. So you can send a time limited offer. So you could say uh, we require a response within 14 days. And if we don't receive a response, we'll take it you're no longer interested in the position. And then that way you can look to re-advertise a position depending on your needs. In terms of another quite important document to consider is a contract of employment. Now, this is one of the key documents that will need to be issued to employees on or before their start date. Now, this recently changed as part of the good work plan that was introduced in 2020. Prior to that, all you have to do is issue the statement of main terms within two months, but now it has to be on or before the individual starts. Now, in terms of the contract employment itself, it will have a lot more information than the offer letter. We've got into a lot more depth, but we've been talking about things like the employee's rights in terms of if they wanted to make a, or lodge rather a grievance, if you had to take down the disciplinary or grievance route, you'd look to cover those topics, along with what sort of um, rights they have in terms of uh, benefits. So, you know, if there's a company car, if there's enhanced sick pay, if you offer anything beyond statutory sick pay in that instance. You also have to consider the position that they have as well within the organization and where they fall within your organizational chart as well, whether it be any sort of mandatory training or induction period that they'll need to engage in as part of the recruitment exercise as well. Uh, and finally as well, whether or not, or rather how long the notice period will be as well, should you know you have to give notice or should they have to serve notice and leave the business. So it's quite an important document, have a whole host of topics. And in terms of this document, I mean, if it doesn't encompass everything, then what you can also look to do is have a staff handbook, which is another key document as well. So the staff handbook could expand on the contract of employment itself. So where the contract of employment might just mention the fact that there is a discipline procedure, usually it's going to probably say, please refer to the wider process in the handbook itself. Uh, and in the handbook, you'll set up step by step exactly what process the individuals need to follow when it comes to um, the disciplinary side of things. So it might say, for example, you as the employer would take them for an investigatory meeting first. And if the investigatory meeting warrants any further action, you then take them to a disciplinary meeting. And then on the back of that, you'll issue an outcome and then perhaps give the employee the 
right to appeal that as well. So it's very important to have these policies and procedures in writing as well, because it sets out very clearly in terms of what everyone's obligations are and what the process are um, that needs to be followed as well. So there's no ambiguity on either side as well. Now, an important part to consider when drafting the handbook as well is to consider whether or not the policies contained within it are going to be contractual or non-contractual. So, for instance, you want certain clauses to be non-contractual, such as the disciplinary procedures, because you want the right to be able to amend that if you needed to, because there might have been a change in legislation, or perhaps your existing one isn't quite working. Whereas with contractual procedures, that might be a contractual bonus policy, for instance, depending on performance of the individuals, but you might want to make it clear contractually that you, know, that you will pay them a bonus so long as they meet these eligibility requirements. Or in fact, you might decide, actually, we want to keep the bonus policy non-contractual so to give us discretion to remove it or amend it anytime as well. So really depends on your industry norms there as well. Um, in terms of all the policies that you'd consider in a handbook, you may have things like the privacy notice. So that will be an important document setting up what you do with data, why you process it, how long you keep it for, and so security measures that you've put in place as well. So again, that is quite an important document to consider, particularly in, with GDPR. It's quite a hot topic at the moment in light of the introduction of the UK GDPR itself and the Data Protection Act 2018, just a couple of years ago as well, because not following and complying with the legislation there can lead to quite substantial fines as well. And what I'll do now then is pass you back to my colleague Comfort because that brings us to the end of the key documents to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saido. And it, yeah, you're right. That concludes the main part of our webinar today. And I just want to say to everyone that you might find our publication on how to hire and inspire in the UK useful. It touches on some of the topics we've discussed today. And you can download this by accessing the handout section in your webinar panel. Uh, moving on to our upcoming events that may be of interest to you. We do have an event coming up on Tuesday, the 23rd of May at 10 a.m. And that is on protecting your business's intellectual property. So please feel free to register uh, for this webinar um, using the link if you uh, are available on that day. So we are going to be answering your questions very, very shortly. But whilst we give you some time to submit them, we'll take a minute to tell you about Legal Vision and our membership. So Legal Vision's membership is a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates you experience in other traditional law firms. How we work is that for an affordable monthly fee, you will receive um, cost certainty as well as all-inclusive legal services. So when we say all inclusive uh, legal services, we mean unlimited documents review, including drafting, amending, and reviewing documents such as your business contracts and commercial leases. It also includes unlimited advice consultations with our team of specialist lawyers, and that is on all areas, including business structuring, restructuring, employment, HR, disputes, and more. And the other thing as well is that you receive unlimited domestic trademark registration, which is very, very important if you have um, a new business, a small business, or you're looking to be known in your sector, um, you want to protect your brand. So Legal Visions membership is like having your own in-house counsel, of course, without the high fees. So what we do is we take care of all your business as usual legal work, and you can focus on running your business. And if you're an in um, in-house lawyer or in-house counsel, then our membership is also quite useful and cost-effective solution for you, because what you can then do is to outsource additional legal work to us so we can assist you. As um, Saidu mentioned during the presentation today, as an employer and a UK business, you do have a legal duty to manage health and safety of your workers and other people that may be affected by the work you do and um, this includes like your customers, your clients, contractors, suppliers, and the visitors to your um, workplace. So what Legal Vision also does is that we do have a health and safety at work advisory service, whereby for a small additional fee to your Legal Vision membership, our experienced solicitors will provide you with a comprehensive risk management and compliance framework to allow you to comply with your health and safety legal obliga uh, obligations here in the UK. 
So if you wanted to learn more about Legal Vision, our membership, and perhaps our health and safety add-on service, and how we can help you, then you can request a free um, consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar. And if you wanted to talk to us about anything we've discussed here today, I would say, please do take advantage of that free consultation um, uh, uh, for, that's provided to you in today's webinar. So what we're going to do now then is we will answer some of your questions uh, very quickly. And um, thanks for submitting them, I must say. Thank you, Confer. Yeah, I can see just the first uh, come question just popped through here. Um, so one of the delegates has asked, can a self-employed person bring an employment tribunal claim? So the short answer to that is no, they can't, but it does come with some caveats. So what you have to consider is moving back to our slides is that when we look at someone who's self-employed, if they're truly self-employed, then no, they can't bring a tribunal claim because they're not an employee or a worker. However, depending on how your employment relationship has worked in practice, you may find yourself in a situation where someone who initially started with you as an independent contractor has become an employee because they've become integrated within the business, you've exerted more control over them, they've done all the work personally themselves and never had the right to substitute, and there's also mutuality obligation, meaning that you're obliged to give them work and they're obliged to accept that work as well. So if all those sort of ingredients are met, which is known as the irreducible minimum, then it is very likely that the individual will be considered as an employee or a worker. And in those circumstances, if they felt agree for any reason, maybe they've been dismissed and they've got over two years of service, they could potentially bring a claim in the employment tribunal. However, that's not to say that you can't try and defend the claim. And what you would do effectively is argue that as a jurisdictional point, that you believe the individual to be a self-employed individual and try to have the claim struck out in that fashion. Another way they could also consider a claim is also through the civil courts anyway. So the example I gave before was the fact that, you know, if there's unpaid invoices, they could look just take through the civil court for a breach contract and look to seek a remedy that way as well, along with um, other types of claims in the civil court, such as for discrimination as well. So hopefully that answers the question there. Thank you, Saido. I'll take the next question, which is, um, if we don't have the budget to pay the national minimum wage, can we hire a volunteer? Uh, that is actually a very good question because we do have um, some of our clients um, that ask exactly the same question. So as Saido explained during the presentation, the legal status of an individual that works for your company or that you engage is quite in important as what it does is it determines the extent of any statutory employment rights that they may have. So when we're thinking about or we're looking at volunteers, they're not an employee and they're not workers. And of course, they're not independent contractors. But if you identify the kind of person that will benefit from volunteering for a few hours um, a week in your business, and in exchange, of course, they get the work experience and you get someone that can help you with one or two things, then you can, in fact, give them that opportunity. Um, so because they're not employees or workers, they are not entitled to the national minimum wage, which is something that will meet your budget. However, there are certain things you have to understand, which is one of them is that there is no uh, mutuality of obligation, as I do explain this as well earlier on. So there is no expectation that they must work a certain hours. So you cannot insist that they work a set number of days or hours per week. Example, you can insist that they work nine to five, Monday to Friday, as you would an employee with an employment contract. So you wouldn't have similar contractual relationship with a volunteer. And generally how it works is that um, you just have a, an understanding that, you know, we would hope that you'd be able to volunteer on, you know, for a few hours a week, but do let us know if you can't. So that's the nature of the relationship. So I would say if you're looking for someone to, if there's a real business need that a work must be done and you have a specific time it must be done by, then you're better off having an employee or worker um, instead of having a volunteer because you wouldn't be able to insist that they do, they do all that work for you. And the other thing as well is that when you have a volunteer and, you know, and it's a genuine volunteering arrangement, you must limit payment to their out-of-pocket expenses um, that is incurred as part of the volunteer arrangement and which is evidenced by receipts. So sometimes you may feel like, you know, I can't pay them the national minimum wage because they're volunteers, but um, I want to pay them a little bit extra just to show that I appreciate their work. You can't really do that because doing that will 
in fact, expose your business uh, by giving them that title of a worker or an employee. So let's say now, you know, you have a volunteer and their travel to your workplace is five pounds a day. You, and they give you a receipt for five pounds a day. You can't pay 20 pounds into their bank account. By doing that and paying them over and above their actual expenses, it may be regarded as income. And that suggests that the intern or the volunteer is in fact a worker or an employee. And if that's the case, then you will be required to pay them the national minimum wage, their holiday pay, and they'll be entitled to other benefits that um, is afforded to an employee. So um, generally, it is quite um, an important, um, you know, volunteers are quite important to businesses like small businesses and even charities and other businesses. But it's important that you understand your obligations to them and theirs to you, just so that you don't risk them falling into the wrong um, status or category. Okay. Thank you there, Kung. Um, I can see there's one other question there then uh, where someone has asked, what are my rights if I use a contractor and they send someone to work that isn't qualified for the job? So that's another great question that's been asked there by one of the delegates. So in, in terms of, you know, what are your rights? Well, it depends really on, do you have a written agreement? If you do, then that's the first thing that we need to look at. And we need to look at the provisions within that in terms of if you're not quite happy with the service, Maybe there's a dispute clause there, which allows you to seek a remedy or ask the individual contractor to, to remedy the situation within a, a period of time. And if they are sending, you know, someone who's not qualified for the job, the first thing you have to consider is the fact they have the right to send a substitute if they are genuinely self-employed, because that is a fundamental right of someone who is self-employed. Now, if they're sending someone to Harvard that you're not quite happy with, then again, we need to look at the contract and consider are there any clauses in there that support my rights as the uh, employer there? So if there are nothing, if there is nothing in there at all, or the contract is silent in genuine, in general, then what you can consider is just speaking to the contractor themselves and trying to come to some sort of an agreement. Or if you don't have a written agreement, maybe put one in place with perhaps our support, for instance, uh, we could put certain clauses in the actual arrangement itself that you have with the independent contract so that if they do send someone to yourself, they have to be suitably qualified. Perhaps you get to also consider their qualifications before you agree to them sending a substitute. So there are some options or the final option, you know, if things are not working out, you could look at the contracts and see what the termination provisions are like, or if there is no contract, then there may be no notice that needs to be served there. But again, just boiling back to it all from the start, we have to consider employment status and if they are genuinely self-employed, because if there's an argument that could be made that they're an employee, then we have to be aware of their rights as well. So it's very important to always consider that point as well. And hopefully that addresses the question there. But you know, if you wanted to discuss any of the points further that we've gone through today, then by all means, please use the free consultation that comes with your attendance as part of this session. Thank you very much there, Saido. And um, that's all we have time for today. As Saido said there, please, if we couldn't get to your questions, do feel free to use that free consultation and get in contact with also us so you can sit with myself or Saido and we can go through your questions in more detail. And um, after the webinar ends, a survey will pop up. So we would really appreciate it if you could complete the 30 second survey for us today. Please include your contact details to, of course, receive the complimentary legal consultation. Uh, and that will help us sit with you and discuss your legal obligations when hiring new staff. So once again, we'd like to say thank you so much for joining us today and do enjoy the rest of your week.